Hi folks, um, next video is just going to be a comparison really of um, those who prospered in the 1920s and those who didn't. So I've touched on it in an earlier video that um, the Roaring Twenties nickname maybe didn't really sum it up for everyone when you're looking at 50% or just over 50% of Americans actually were the ones who could have probably said yeah I'm doing well in the 20s whereas um, the other 50% or just under weren't doing that well um, so there was an estimate of 50% or just below of Americans in this time period were not earning the two thousand um, dollars minimum um, that was seen as required to be successful in that time period. Two thousand, the um, fifty percent weren't earning this two thousand um, dollars, so that was not really the best statistic to show that America was doing like really really well, especially when you got Hoover at the end of the twenties saying America was near the final victory over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. It, it doesn't really back that up. But it is known as the Roaring Twenties. So just as a quick recap, um, for example, the wealth wasn't spread. So if you were uh, um, working in an old industry such as coal mining, textiles, etc., you weren't benefiting in the 1920s. There were new methods of um, power, for example, um, electricity coming around at that time meaning the demand for coal wasn't what it once was. Textiles such as cotton, well, you've got nylon and such starting to come around. So those industries didn't have the same pull that they used to have. They didn't provide the same wage that they used to. Um, farmers just suffered throughout. Um, with machinery and the like, they were producing far too much. And because of this, there was a lot of um, farm surplus that was just never sold, and it meant the prices were permanently below what they should have been. So a lot of farmers suffered. Um, you've also got black Americans were suffering from discrimination throughout. Um, they usually found they were in the worst paid jobs and they were also usually the first people to be fired in the event of that needing to happen. With the poor education that was on offer and segregated education, black Americans didn't usually have the same uh, education afforded to them. And there was also um, look down upon any type of aspirations it was very hard for a black american to aspire to be a lawyer or the like so for example years later malcolm x would have said as a child oh i want to be a lawyer and he was scoffed at by his teacher for it um black people also because of their poor wages usually had poor living conditions and um, lived in slums ghettos etc and the same applied for immigrants who worked for less were paid less than what they were worth um and again had access to the uh poor living and social conditions at the time. Um, you've also got um, some of these industries um, were starting to struggle. So as the 20s progressed and people, um, if you remember that we looked at when the, the Ford and McCumber tariff came in, um, where it said, oh, buy American and, and, and put taxes on other goods to encourage people to buy American. Well, foreign countries did this to America as well. So you found that but as the 20s went on, the wealth wasn't the same as what it once had been because overseas markets were producing their own goods and didn't want to buy American because of what America had done to their goods earlier with the Ford and McCumber tariff. Um, just before the Wall Street crash, um, you could look at, for example, farmers in North Carolina, their average wage, sorry, South Carolina, their average wage was $129 a month. Whereas in California, the fruit farmers were making $1,246 a month. So there was a difference in farmers. And again, north-south divide, <coughs> you made over $880 a month if you lived in New York. Because the town was just a, a worker in the town. Whereas you made just over $400 a month. 412 I think, if you were working in South Carolina, which is in the deep south. So it's not great. Um... Basically, then you've you've got a problem. Um, but on the flip side, there were people who enjoyed the Roaring Twenties. So obviously, there was that fifty percent or just over who were living well. There was a lot of people in the cities in the north and over on the west coast, particularly fruit farmers, who had good standards of living. Um, 
at this same period in time, people could say the Roaring Twenties was roaring because there was huge advances in the film industry. So you saw um, the star system start to come in for films where basically films would be advertised now on having a big name. So it's like today, if you go to see a, um, I'll try to think, San Andreas, you, you'll, you'll get all Dwayne Johnson in San Andreas and it'll advertise like Dwayne Johnson The Rock just as much as you would um, advertise the film San Andreas. And this started in the 20s to put people like Charlie Chaplin out there as, um, or oh, Charlie Chaplin is, and then Chaplin's film. People wanted to see their heroes. And there was big advances in the film world where before it had been silent movies. And um, what happened basically was, obviously the talkies came in, and a lot of film stars who had accents or strange voices no longer were the film star drawer anymore because of that, and it was off-putting. So it had this new generation of actor and film star, and Hollywood became something people wanted to watch, films, a pastime, something you could do. Um, on top of that, <coughs> Um, basically, that leads to Hollywood having a boom. So this was this multi-million dollar um, entertainment industry became based there. But you've also got the, the jazz age. So you've got places like Harlem and New York uh, giving place uh, birth and um, voice to this new type of music, jazz. And this was from mainly black and Jewish and Jewish musicians, but mainly black because the the people who had formerly been in their uh, slavery had not been classically trained and people who were black Americans usually weren't afforded the chance for classical training so habits were picked up and new sounds started to form and it would eventually go into jazz and blues music so you've got people like you know Louis Armstrong and Count Basie and stuff like that who were well-known jazz, blues, swing music musicians very popular in areas such as Harlem and it was this was a brand new craze um, on top of this, um, you've got women. Um, women's rights changed dramatically at this time. So after World War One, like it was, a, you could look at Britain and say, oh well, it brought the vote in and changed everything for British women. Um, after World War One, women were given the vote, but women's status changed dramatically. So women was more likely to be in jobs and earn their own money, and the way women were looked at changed as well. So in the past, if you had a photograph or a, you would look at a woman in the 1800s and they would have the bonnet on, the classic southern belle as you would say, the bonnet on and the, the long hair and the very like princessy style dress that went all the way down to the angles they would act in a very ladylike manner often defer to men in conversation and the like and um, what you've got is by the twenties you get a new generation, flappers come in because of wearing their boots around their angles with their laces undone, flapping around but the skirts became a lot shorter, the bob hairstyle came into fashion, women smoked, women were drinking, women um, were going out without a chaperone or a man to escort them, so women were going out you know, with the girls, so to speak, and um, they seemed to be having a good time. Chanel No. 5 perfume became like almost the flapper's uh, mainstay, so it became very powerful for them. The beads were worn around their neck. Um, also didn't wear gloves, which was seen as outrageously uh, flirtatious, um, that you would uh, touch bare skin hand to hand without wearing gloves. Um, swimming costumes, women could be arrested on beaches for their costumes being too revealing, and you, you would get a shock at what too revealing was back then. Um, and you saw women particularly finding work in areas such as teachers and secretaries and such, but it was a huge change an advancement for women in this time period. Um, so that that was pretty big and you had a, a period of crazes as well. So it was a um, norm where people would like, try to beat world records to prove they were having a good time. So it was like, you know, how long can we dance for? You know, um, Alvin Shipwreck Kelly, how long could he sit on top of a flagpole for? Um, Lucky Lindy made the transatlantic flight from New York, uh, from America to Paris, um, just drinking, you know, drinking pints of water and eating sandwiches and slapping himself to keep awake. But he became a rare, a national celebrity because he managed to do it. So it was a time of confidence, an experiment. Um, you know, you had new board games like mahjong came in, um, which people liked to play. 
Um, also, there was this the sports um, system was massive at that time. So, you know, it was Babe Ruth was the top baseball star of the time period, uh, the Bambino, and he was getting paid something like eighty thousand dollars a year, which is the equivalent of seven million pounds a year now. And he was a celebrity in his own right. Um, so the New York Yankees were quite famous. You actually um, saw uh, boxing become a, a big deal. And boxing fights were uh, broadcast via radio, which was a, a new invention back then. And that opened the market up to people who couldn't go there live. Um, so it was it was a it was a big deal. Things were changing. Um, you know the the jazz age and the music and the going out and the flappers go hand in hand with the banning of alcohol. People still went to the speakeasies. So it was a period where there was an incredible amount of um, confidence being expressed by a lot of Americans at that time that they were in a good age and that things were going right. But underpinning it all, um, you still had um, the negatives where obviously the people who weren't benefiting, but then you've got the, the threat of the Red Scare where there was this fear of communism and this fear of um, revolts and um, basically this fear of people bringing political ideas into the country from places like Russia that weren't going to be very well liked. So communists in particular, there was a fear of that in the Red Scare. If you look at the Sacco and Vanzetti case, which I'll talk about in another video, where there was a fear that they had links to anarchy. So it was a fear of like, oh, they're going to try and take over and cause chaos in society. The Ku Klux Klan going after Catholics and Jews as well as black people. Um, so and then you've got the age of the gangster, where um, born out of prohibition you had um, whereas some people like the likes of Al Capone and gangsters, you had people who were um, the victims of like seeing like actually violent crime t going on. It was the age of the Tommy gun, um, and you had some people did resent Al Capone and other gangsters for making their living outside the law, becoming multi you know like Bill Gates type wealth by breaking the law. So it was a roaring twenties, but it was only a roaring twenties. As some, not all.